I told you I was weird, and I would love to claim credit that I had this master plan that for every one of the sermons in this series, there was going to be a B-52 song to go with it. But this just happened. I like that. Thank Bruce Major for giving me this idea, so thank you very much. You can, if you don't like what just happened, talk to Bruce after, over there. So we are beginning this second sermon in our series, Nine Surefire Ways to Avoid Being Happy or... Jordan Peterson meets Jesus. Well, what does that mean? If you weren't with us last week, what we're talking about is this. We're taking the very practical but very challenging and difficult teachings of a secular psychologist about how to live life well in the world, not the world you wish it was, but the world that actually is. And then we're looking at how does that connect to the wisdom of the ancient teaching of the scriptures, because there's some wild resonance there, And then we're going beyond all that to the supernatural revelation of Jesus Christ because philosophy and wisdom are good, but they're not enough. We need more. So we're going to go from practical tips about life to the author of life. Now, I want to give you a sense of what kind of congregation you're in. Um, I walked into my pew this morning, and this is what I found waiting for me. I love you guys. I love this. If you were here last week, we said that the first rule was to act like the lobster, which was actually to realize and admit that we were created to be social beings. And as social beings, the way you carry yourself sends a signal to other people. Other people interpret who you are and how to treat you based on how you physically present yourself in the world. You might not think that's fair, you might not think that's right, but that's the way the world is as social creatures. We're calling this series Nine Surefire Ways to Avoid Being Happy because we want to look at nine ways we sabotage ourselves, we shoot ourselves in the foot. In other words, part of the misery in my own life is not my fault. But a big chunk of the misery in my life is my own fault. There are things that I do to sabotage myself, shoot myself in the foot. Last week, we looked at the first one, which was to, to not even pay attention to that, uh, taking responsibility for our own life and how we present ourselves in the world. Today, we're looking at a second one, which is this. The second surefire way to make sure you have a miserable life is to isolate yourself from others or be passive in your relationships. So it makes sense also that since we're social creatures, our relationships can not only be a sense source of great hope and joy, they can be a great source of misery depending on what's going on there. So we're gonna look at three different ways that we shoot ourselves in the foot with relationships. The first one is the one you just heard about, isolation, that I can tend to isolate myself and withdraw into a life of superficial loneliness. That's the first thing I can do. Second thing I can do is either be attracted to or passively put up with people who are absolutely no good for me, who ruin my life. And then the third is I can fail to pursue relationships with the people who bring the very best out of me. I can be passive and not pursue the very relationships that I need. So let's look at that first one, that idea of isolating and withdrawing ourselves. And what is the result of that? It's loneliness. And loneliness is no small detail. For many people, maybe you, it is the number one ache in people's lives. You know, it's, it's a weird thing. We were promised um, that when we got these, everything would get better. Now, some things did get better. But listen to this. This is a brand new study out this May, so just a couple months ago, from Cigna, the healthcare company. They found that young adults, listen to this stat, young adults are the loneliest generation of Americans, more disconnected and isolated than even our nation's elderly. Let that sink in. How is it possible that at a time when access to friendship is at its peak, especially through social media, smartphones, connection, when people are less encumbered, more than half of young adults say they feel left out, isolated, and without anyone to talk to? Meanwhile, we have other studies that tell us that meaningful, significant relationships help your mental health, 
help your physical health result in you actually living longer. Man, how, how is this? Well, I've been thinking about this a little bit, and here's what I'd like to say. If I keep pulling away from real relationships, like face to face with you, and keep mediating all my relationships through this dark glass, I was trying to think about what that's like. I, you know what I think it is? I think it's like fast food for relationships. In other words, when I mediate my relationships through this black glass, it's like I'm eating junk food. I mean, think about it. First of all, it's easy, it's quick, it's addicting. Think about potato chips. Think about like, unlike, tweet. Ooh, what did they put? It's addicting, and you can get right in and get right out. Just unfriend them. So I happen to like fast food. Everyone knows that the best restaurant in the country is Burger King. If you have any problems with that, see me after this service. All right, so I actually like junk food, but here's the thing. If all you're eating is junk food, you're dead meat. And, and I feel like what's happening is a lot of people, it's like they're going more and more away from the broccoli and more and more toward the junk food, and it's having a real impact on us. In the midst of that, do you know what one of the very first and most important statements from God is in the Bible? God says this, it is not good for man to be alone. It is not good for woman to be alone. God doesn't want that for us. God designed us for intimate relationships. God designed us for good relationships, flourishing relationships. Now, some of you here, like me, are introverts. And we're starting to get a little nervous with this conversation because we're thinking like, oh, so what you're telling me is I need tons of people around me all the time. You know, there's actually some pretty good reasons for withdrawing. There's actually some pretty good reasons for isolating. There's some reasons for saying relationships are just not worth the hassle and the effort. I'd rather just withdraw and isolate myself and mediate the world through this dark glass. But just like we said last week, the problem with that is it's a positive feedback loop, by which I mean in a negative way, in that the more I withdraw, the lonelier I become. And the lonelier I become, the more frustrated with the world I become, and the more I withdraw, and I withdraw, and then my social skills get even more awkward, and life gets more awkward. And so the more I give into that easy way out, just sit at home with this, the worse things get. And so, although uh, I need to have relationships, there actually are these good reasons not to have them. Because why? Because people are messy, and they're frustrating, and they're inconsistent, and some people are downright nasty and hurtful, and we get wounded, and we say, why do I even put up with this? I'm going home. But if I give in to that, the situation just gets worse. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take a few minutes talking about the very worst relationships, and we're going to go all the way up to the very best relationships. And as I do this, I want you to think about people you know, and I want you to think about relationships you're involved in right now. The truth is, one of the best reasons to withdraw and just be on our own and pour our lives into something else like work or, or, or entertainment is that there really are such things as toxic relationships. Now, that word toxic is way overused in our society, but I think in this particular case, it actually is applicable. This idea of toxic. Are you in a toxic relationship? How would you know? Jordan Peterson says this, if you have a friend whose friendship you wouldn't recommend to your sister or your father or your son, why would you have such a friend for yourself? Friendship is a reciprocal agreement. You are not morally obligated to support someone who's making the world worse. So what you're going to see in this sermon series is we're going to look at what Jordan Peterson says, and then we're going to look at what Scripture says. All right, so what does the wisdom of the ancient Scriptures say? In the Old Testament, in Proverbs, it says, do not make friends 
with a hot-tempered man. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn his ways and get what? Get yourself ensnared. And so the Old Testament is saying there are people you need to stay away from. And one of them is that kind of person because when you hang out with them, you may become like them, take on their traits. And I think all of us have to admit there are some people in our lives that when we're around them, it doesn't bring the best out in us. And the truth is we don't want to pretend we're like, well, I'm not a four-year-old, I'm not an adolescent, but we are still influenced by our peers. And there are people who are living not good ways, and when I hang around with them, I find I don't live in good ways either. Well, that was the Old Testament. How about the New Testament? In Ephesians 5, 7, Paul is looking at people who um, have some serious moral problems, and he's saying, have nothing to do with them. Do not even associate with them. And you're like, wait, I thought Christians were all lovey-dovey, and we're supposed to be getting along with everybody, be connected with everybody. The Old and the New Testament tell you there are certain people in this world that you need to stay away from, even if they want to be with you. So what do we mean by toxic relationship? Here's the way I think about it. See if this is helpful for you. Imagine what it's like. It's like you're in this garage with that person, and they've got their car running, okay? So you're in a sealed garage. The car's running. You know what's happening, right? What's happening to the carbon monoxide level? It's going up and up and up. Now, here's the problem with carbon monoxide. You cannot see it, and you cannot smell it. When you smell fumes from a car, that is not carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide cannot be seen, and it cannot be smelled. In this room right now, there is carbon monoxide, but the level is so low, it's not toxic, but at some point, it begins to get toxic, and what happens is, you begin to get a headache, you begin to feel nauseous, you, you just feel weak, confused, and if you keep on going, it will actually kill you. Well. If someone is toxic emotionally, like if someone is physically beating you, abusing you, you know that's toxic, you know you need to get out. But when it's emotional abuse, you can't see it and you can't smell it. And you can't point to one thing and go, that's it, that's the proof right there. And they're like, what, I'm not doing anything, look, I'm not even touching you. Their car's just running. And it's not till you get outside of the garage, out in the open blue air, and get fresh oxygen, that suddenly you realize, holy cow, I wasn't the crazy one. That was killing me. And so the, the tricky part is with toxic relationships, when it's this emotional thing, not a physical thing, it's like you can't point to it. It's, it's the environment itself. It makes it tough. So what do we do with people who are either knowingly toxic, right? They're just cruel, nasty people, or unknowingly. Like, they might just be, look, man, I'm just running my car. Or the third is someone who's just a bad influence. They might be the nicest person. Like, there might be someone in your life that, like, I love that guy, but when I'm with him, I drink too much. Well, then you shouldn't spend as much time with him. How do we deal with all of these kind of folks, these kind of relationships? What do we do with people who either knowingly or unknowingly, uh, doing this to us? Well, the truth is we need to set boundaries between us and people who are toxic to our souls or people who are simply a bad influence. And again, a lot of us have heard this word. Maybe it's been beaten to death, but I really think it's crucial. I think it's actually absolutely crucial. So what does boundaries mean? Boundaries mean you are taking responsibility for your situation and you're in charge. You're going to set the limits and the boundaries for this relationship. Well, how about them? They don't think there's any problem. They don't even know there's carbon monoxide. So you have to take responsibility. And what you have to do is you have to decide for yourself what are the limits on where, when, how, and how long, and under what circumstances you're willing to be with this person. You know, you can go into a closed garage for a little bit. But you need to decide that, not them, because they don't even think there's a problem. You also need to limit your depth of intimacy. Some of us, this is obvious, but some of us, this is not. It's like, I know people who are way too intimate with people who are no good for them. So you need to evaluate, can I trust this person? Has, has history taught me that they can handle it if I'm intimate? And so you need to evaluate that and go, you know what? I'm going to be kind. I'm going to be nice. I'm going to speak the truth. But I'm only going to let them get in this far. Because that's wisdom. It's not being mean. 
It's being wise. For some of you, the biggest step you could take right now in your life for personal growth and flourishing and walking with Jesus is just switching the people you're hanging out with. But there's a cost to that. You'd have to give up the known and you'd have to go through a season of that lonely and who wants that? There's a cost. And yet if you're willing to do that, that could be the, the most dramatic change in your life is just changing who are the people you're hanging out with. Now I wanna say one quick word before we move on about marriage. When I become friends with someone, I don't say, for better, for worse, for sig- forsaking all others. No, I don't, I don't say that in my friendships. I say that, well, I said it once on my wedding day. That's a different situation. That's a covenant vow. And so I want to throw out this idea. I'm not saying that if there's a lot of fighting and arguing and frustrating in your marriage that you just give up and refuse to do the hard work of learning to live with someone who is very different than you. That's hard work, but it's worth fighting for. On the other hand, infidelity, physical or mental abuse, fear for your safety, that's toxic. And no one has to put up with that. All right, so we see we've been talking about some really not enjoyable things here. And so because relationships can be so painful, we can be tempted to be hermit crabs. You know, you think about a hermit crab. You pull in their little shell. They're just wandering alone through the ocean. But what did Genesis say to us? It is not good. It is not good for a man to be alone. It is not good for a woman to be alone. We were designed for friendships. We were designed for relationships. Listen to what Ecclesiastes says. We're in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, starting in verse 8. Just listen and imagine this scene. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil. Some people just pour their lives into their work. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked. And why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. No, two are better than one because they have good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Some of us know what this feels like deep, deep in our bones. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. No, we were designed for this. We were designed for this relationship together. What does Jordan Peterson say? He says this, friendship is a reciprocal arrangement. I can pull you up. You can pull me up. What does 1 Thessalonians 5, 7 say? Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up. But notice it's not one way. It's not like you just keep encouraging, 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 or for some of us, just encourage me, encourage me, encourage me, build me up, build me up, build me up. Build. It's never meant to be one way. It's meant to be back and forth. I build you up, you build me up. I'm down and low, you pull me up. You're down and low, I pull you up. It's meant to be this reciprocal relationship. In other words, God designed us to be interdependent. He designed us to be deeply involved with and interdependent on other people. So think about that. I'm neither dependent, gimme, 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 or I'm not independent. I don't need anybody. I'm my little hermit crab. I'm all alone. Leave me alone. No, it's interdependent, back and forth. And so this morning we now come to rule number two, which is this. Don't live in your own private Idaho. 
Don't live like a hermit crab. Make friends with people who want the best for you. Not make friends with anybody. Make friends with people who want the best for you. But note there's a cost. There's a cost for hanging out with people who are good for you. Did you ever think about that? There's, see, there's a cost in everything. There's a cost. You see, if you really want people who are good for you, we need to be willing to be corrected by the people who have our best interests in mind. So again, if you look at the back of your bulletin, you're, you'll find that we're working through these basic notes. And the idea is if you actually fill in these blanks, then not only can this help you think about this this week, but you can use your notes in your small groups. So our small groups are actually based on these sermons you're hearing. We need to be willing to be corrected. In other words, if I just surround myself with yes men, if I just surround myself with people who are like, just tell me I'm great, tell me I'm great, tell me I'm great, I'm not going to grow at all. Listen to what Jordan Peterson says. He says this, if you surround yourself with people who support your upward aim, they will not tolerate your cynicism or your destructiveness. They will instead encourage you when you do good for yourself and others and punish you carefully when you don't. Make friends with people who want the best for you. Do you actually want people like that in your life? People who will hold you to account. Well, what does the scripture say? In Colossians 3, 16 to 17, he's talking about relationships and saying, therefore, with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God, that's what Christian community is like. And that's what I want. I want people in my life who also love Jesus. If you're a Christian, if you love Jesus, and you have nobody in your friendship network that's helping you up, pulling you up, who also is trying to follow Jesus, you're like a, a sheep alone. You're like, and who do the wolves go after? No, we, we, we need people like that in our lives. But notice that little word, admonishing. What does that mean? That means I get in your face. That means you get in my face and go, what are you doing? That's not you. Uh, brother, I don't know if that's actually what Jesus would have you do. Sister, am I willing to have people in my life like that to hold me accountable? All right, so how do we sum this all up? Again, don't live in your own private Idaho. Make friends with people who want the best for you and will draw you closer to God. So I want people in my life who not only want the best for me, I want people in my life who will draw me closer to God and who God can use me to draw them closer as well. And notice, um, this isn't just about being around with people who make you feel good. What I'm asking you is, are you pursuing mentors? And I don't care if you're like 75 years old. Certainly there's somebody who knows Jesus or, or has, who lives life in a way that you admire. Are you willing to pursue people when you look at them, you go, I would like to be like them. So here's a little thought experiment. Can you think of a time or a person that when you were with them, it just, wanted, it just made you want to be better? That, that when you were in their presence, you were like, man, I want to be the best me I can be. So just take one second to try and think about someone like that at any moment in your life, somewhere along the way, when I was in their presence, it just makes me want to be better. It makes me want to be more of what God is calling me to be. Okay, so the next question is, if that person is still alive, how passive are you about your relationship with them? Or are you intentionally pursuing relationships with people like that? Okay, now... We've gone as far as Jordan Peterson goes. And all of this is important groundwork. But then the scriptures go beyond getting our own needs met. Over and over, you've heard in this church the, the analogy of being on an airplane and the announcement comes on. It says, in the case of cabin failure, put your own mask on first before you help others. Why? 
Because if you don't get your own mask on, if you don't get your own environment settled, and you start to get deprived, you're going to be no good to anybody. So the first step is, am I taking these steps? Am I pulling out of isolation? Am I saying no to unhealthy relationships? Am I pursuing healthy relationships? But once I have that mask on, I am my brother's keeper. God has called me to not make my life about me. Once we've been taking responsibility, once we've taken responsibility for our own environment, we need to go beyond our own needs to the call of Christ. And what is that call? Well, here's how it appears in Romans 12. Have the same regard for one another. Do not be haughty. What does that mean? Don't be stuck up. Don't think you're all that. Don't think you're superior, but associate with the lowly, with the friendless, with the loveless, with the brokenhearted, with the poor, with the needy. Do not be wise in your own estimation. You see, this is the calling beyond fair. This is the calling of Jesus. You are to be his hands and feet. You think about the what Bob lifted up in prayer. We have friends very right now who are using their hands and feet to help people who are in need. In other words, if I'm to take the name of Christian upon myself, I need to love the friendless in response to Jesus' love for me. In other words, to, to remember, if you've ever experienced this in your life yet, that when you actually encounter Jesus and you realize this isn't some guy long ago, this isn't like just some historical figure. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he's actually present here now. And he saw me. He saw all my ugliness, all my brokenness. He saw my nastiness, my selfishness, my pride, and he still loved me. Well, then I need to pay this thing forward. I need to let his love pour through me to other people. This is what I was made for. I was made to allow God's love to pour through me into other people. All right, well, how can I do this, though? And, and how can I have the energy and the tenacity and I know myself? Like, how can I actually live this way? Well, I want to show you a picture of the person who pours the most life and hope and encouragement into my life. That guy. Now, I admit Ruth is a really close second, my wife, but it's Jesus. You know, you think about it. If there was one person who truly wanted what's best for me. If there was one person who perfectly wanted what's best for you, that's the friend I need. That's the primary first friend I need to have. And knowing him is like starting life all over again. Knowing him, coming to that point where you bend your knee and say, I've had enough trying to do this on my own, I'm actually going to dare to be a fool and actually believe there's a God here who has a calling on my life and submit my life to him. When I do that, what happens? It's like waking up from a dream. It's like being born again. It's like a brand new start. There's a new me. Peter puts it this way, for you have been born again not of a seed which is perishable like all the things in this world, but something that's imperishable because it comes from outside this world in through the living and enduring word of God. And Jesus is the living, enduring word of God. 